this morning, um, I want to speak to you about something that's really, really uh, dear to my heart because, um, you know, it hasn't been the flashiest couple of weeks. Poor old James has got hand-picked things in his head because I've been picking him um, with all the stuff that we've been involved in and stuff like that. But he's he's survived, so you want to give him a hand for that. He survived. So one of the one of the things is about God defining us, and it's all about looking at perspectives. So um, uh, perspectives that are the way we view our world. Perspectives can be liberating, or or can be restricting, depending on what perspective we are viewing our world with. And a perspective that frees us enables us to see another way. A perspective that binds us, locks us into seeing our world only one way, bringing entrapment to our lives. And I'm sure all of us have had, at, at one point in our life, we've felt trapped like we're in a cul-de-sac because our perspective won't let us, allow us a way out. And so I'm going to go to a story of a man in John 5 who through life circumstances found himself in a place where his perspective had ground to a halt. I just want to pray before we get started. Father, I want to thank you for this word. And as I always do say, whatever is you, Lord, help it to stick to us, stick to our spirit so it can help us in the time to come ahead. And I pray also, Father God, all that stuff is just me. Uh, perhaps it's my mind meandering, getting older and all that. <laughs> perhaps it's that. But Lord, I pray that even um, those things that don't belong, Lord God, in this message today would just fall to the ground. We give you glory, God, because that's what we do. And we praise you for your word, that we can actually uh, read your word, Lord, freely in our country. In Jesus' name. Amen. So we go to uh, the story of in John, and it says this, Afterward, Jesus returned to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish holidays. Inside the city, near the Sheep Gate, was the pool of Bethsaida with five covered porches. Crowds of sick people, blind, lame, or paralyzed, lay on the porches. One of the men lying there had been sick, sick for 38 years. And when Jesus saw him and knew he had been ill for a long time, he asked him, would you like to get well? Oh, I can't, sir, he said, for I have no one to put me into the pool when the water bubbles up. Someone else always gets there ahead of me. And Jesus said to him, stand up, pick up your mat and walk. Instantly, the man was healed. He rolled up his sleeping mat and began walking. Now, this is a story that we... Um, that we often see, and but it's, I think James was said at um, House Church over in, where was it, Massey this week. There's many ways of looking at one scripture. God's word is amazing like that. So we see in this piece of scripture that Jesus comes into a place called Bethesda, where there are crowds of sick people, all of them waiting for one event to happen. They are waiting for the water to bubble up because every year when the water would bubble, they would get into the water and be healed. And among them was one man who had been sick for 38 years. The fact that the man had been waiting for a long time tell me, tells me that he had a one-day mindset. One day I'll make it to the water and everything will change. And I will be happy and all my dreams will come true. And I'm sure that there have been one time or another when we've been a one-day person. One day when I have enough money. One day when I finish studying and get my degree. One day when I find a wife or a husband. I'm telling you now, that's not always a one-day thing. It's a, it's like, wow, that didn't work, but never mind. Um, one day I'll get a bigger house, better car, better job. One day he'll come around to my way of thinking and everything will be sweet. But it's always that one day, one day, one day. And one day kind of thinking convinces us that believing that our life is locked into our circumstances and deceives us into believing that answers can only be found by human intervention. But we are followers of Christ and we believe in divine intervention. When we give our lives to Christ, he lives on the inside of us. 
And that is where we find answers to life's problems, our life's problems, and sometimes for other people's life problems. Anyway, this man has been waiting for 38 years for his answer. His focus is on the bubbling water as his way of finding happiness. But in the waiting, he stopped experiencing life and he has isolated himself and now it is just him and his illness or his problem. His whole life focus is on waiting for that water to bubble. And he can see nothing else. Life basically stopped for him. He thought he he thought nothing, he thinks nothing good is ever going to happen for him until he's healed in that water. And the scripture says that he was lying there. Those are really profound words, lying there. He saw the world from this place. And so his whole vision was a sea of legs, other sick people just like him, who were lying around like him. And of course, that promise, that pull, that promised him an answer to all his problems. His whole perspective on life was a faceless, expressionless place, a place where he was isolated and alone. A place where he lived below everybody else, where he lived under everybody else, where he lived a life that wasn't quite where God had wanted him to be. So the place where he laid was the place he had made for himself to be, to stay, and to view his life from. His mat that he lay on had become his home. It was as if that the end of the mat mark the boundary of his whole existence. And when we live waiting for an event of human intervention to change our lives, our lives stop and our, our existence seems futile. So huge was his focus on, on the pool being the answer that when Jesus asked him, do you want to be healed? You would think that he would simply answer this like, yes, please, I really do. I want to be healed. But instead, he offers up excuses. And, you know, Luke 6.45 says, uh, 6.45 says, out of the abundance of the mouth, the heart speaks. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Beg your pardon. <clears throat> and we know what is in our heart eventually flows out of our mouth and is what we actually confess. And then he says, I can't. There. I need someone else to put me in the water as soon as it bubbles up, but someone always, someone else always gets there before I do. And he called Jesus Sir. He clearly didn't really realize that a miracle had come to his come his way. He was so focused on how his on how things were going to work out, how humans would carry him to the pool to be healed. There was no room for a miracle. His perspective was confining his life. And you know, that happens to us. We can, we know the promises of God. We, we've, we've seen them in the word. We've heard them in the preaching and the prophesying. But your perspective can sometimes define your life and confine it as well. But there's two things in his reply. Some of us think that we cannot reach our goal unless there is someone else to help us. How often have we heard these? I need someone else to pray for me. My prayers aren't good enough. I've met a lot of people like that who haven't even tried yet because they believe in their heart of hearts that their prayers are not good enough. And what about this one? I need someone to preach the deep truths of the Bible for me to grow. I don't understand the Bible. I never will. And so right there is the confession of his heart. In this one, I can't worship unless the worship leader is someone I like who chooses the songs that I like. Otherwise, I can't worship. And, and the second thing um, that, that, that this, his reply says is there are also those who believe that other people stand between them and their growth or their ministry, growth or their ministry. I've heard this a lot of times. I can't preach the gospel because God, uh, nobody will give me the opportunity. What about this? I can't love others because somebody hurt me. Okay. If somebody would only believe in me, I could do anything. You know, I think to myself, God believes in you. 
That's all we need. So Jesus has a simple answer to all of that. The first thing he says in verse 9 is stand up. Jesus tells, shows the, the, um, the, the sick man a new possibility. God's perspective is available. Get up. Divine intervention is here. Check those thoughts that are confining you to the curb. They, they confine you to be anything less than what God has made you to be. But you've got to stand up to them. You've got to stand up, physically stand up, but you've also got to stand up on the inside. You know, um, counsellors have this thing, have this phrase that talk about taking the power back. And that's when you give the power to somebody else, they make all your decisions for you. But when you take it back, that's when you stand up and, um, and begin to make decisions for yourself. Number two, pick up your mat. Your mat has been defining you. Your, your circumstances have been finding, defining you. Now it's time for the mat to be redefined in your life. It will no longer be your day companion, but it will take place that was always meant for, the place with sleep and rest. You just can't leave your life behind, your situation behind. It's time to pick it up and take charge of it, whatever that is. Pick it up and take charge of it. And, of course, the last thing, that he said was and walk you've got to get going you really do you know I don't I think I've said this a number of times people think that there's going to be God's just going to fall from the sky and the Holy Spirit will move and you just move with a, like moving with a tide but actually God expects us as partners to do our bit and we've got to put one foot in front of the other we've got to get going and move forward and take those steps of faith that God has been telling us to do. We have to stand up. We have to be able to, to walk forward and just, yes, sometimes we have to say, yes, I'm going forward and my focus is Christ. And, you know, at the end of it, verse 9, it says, this, it, says it all. Verse 9 says, instantly the man was healed. He rolled up his sleeping mat and began walking. So he did exactly what the Lord had told him to do. And I just want to ask that question. What about you? It's time to stand up, pick up your mat and walk. If you have been stuck in a situation for a long, long time, if you've been stuck with one thing being your focus and you think, God, I just don't want this anymore, you know, why don't you take a hold of those uh, instructions that God gave that man and, and, and do exactly what he said, stand up to it. Pick up your mat, pick up your circumstances and take charge of it and walk. And, um, you know, I think I think for us sometimes as believers, what we can tend to do is just wait and, and just leave it and wait for an answer to, to fall out of the sky, which is probably um, uh, not what God meant. I've got some discussion questions for you here. Um, when we go into our rooms, you know, share the times in your life where you were, where your wrong perspective was confining you. And number two, can you share a time in your life when divine intervention changed your perspective? 